I know. I know it's difficult to pronounce my name somehow, although it's a very small name. It's a very simple name. My name is Huma, H-U-M-A, and H is not silent. Uh, it's a Persian word, by the way, which means phoenix. So I'm kind of a bird. And uh, I come from Pakistan. I am a corporate lawyer. And I worked for a bank there as senior vice president. And I was heading the law department there. Uh, I've been working on uh, various human rights issues also. I left my religion because of human rights issues. So today, I'll tell you something about the blasphemy laws in general in Pakistan and the background of those blasphemy laws. Because blasphemy essentially carries death penalty in Islam. So we'll talk about what is happening in Pakistan what is the legislation about blasphemy laws, and also what actually is happening there. So let's start. Hmm. OK. So let me, uh, because we have certain images uh, which may not be appropriate for, uh, which are graphic in nature and which you may not find appropriate. So it's, actually it was the British, because India and Pakistan was under British Raj till 1947. And actually it was the British that introduced blasphemy laws in the Indian Penal Code. Because if you see, India was a multicultural a cultural society and multi-ethnic society. So they introduced the laws. The laws still remain a part of the Pakistan Penal Code with some inclusions which were made later on by the military dictator General Ziaul Haq. General Ziaul Haq reigned from 1977 to 1988 and for his own interest and to pro prolong his uh, reign, he uh, used Islam as a weapon. He used Islam as a weapon against minorities. He used Islam as a weapon against different uh, Muslim sects. He used Islam as a weapon against women also. But we are not talking about that right now. OK, the most dangerous sections of the blasphemy laws in the penal code are defiling, etc., of Holy Quran. Holy Quran, Quran is the scripture of Muslims. Whoever willfully defiles, damages, or desecrates a copy of the Holy Quran, or of an extract therefrom, or uses it in any derogatory manner, or for any unlawful purpose, shall be punishable with imprisonment for life. So uh, we'll, talk, uh, we'll talk in detail about this later on. And then this is one of the most commonly used uh, law against minorities, against uh, uh, even Muslims. Use of derogatory remarks, etc., in respect of the Holy Prophet. Whoever, by words, either spoken or written, or by visible representation, or by any imputation, innuendo, or insinuation, directly or indirectly defiles the sacred name of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life, and shall also be liable to fine. So it carries capital punishment. So now, let us see whether, because uh, the general claim of the Muslims is that Islam is a religion of peace, and Muhammad is a blessing for all the universes, not just the universe, for all the universes. So let's see how uh, uh, much blessing he was for the people. There was a woman during the time of Muhammad. Her name was Asma bint Marwan. 
she was killed on the orders of Muhammad for opposing him with her poetry and provoking people to kill him. Abu Afaq was killed on the orders of Muhammad for writing poetry against him. Al-Nazar, it is pronounced as Al-Nazar, was captured during the Battle of Badr. A Quran verse was revealed ordering the execution of Nazar bin Haris. He was one of the two prisoners who were executed and not allowed to be ransomed by their clans because he mocked and harassed Muhammad and wrote poems and stories criticizing him. This happened when Muhammad was in Mecca. When Muhammad was in Mecca, he had only a few followers. So he was trying to be more tolerant towards other. Uh, all the verses in the Holy Quran which are about tolerance and which are about kindness, they were revealed during that time. But we can see that when he uh, went to Medina, when he had a large following, at that time, all that kindness, all that tolerance just evaporated. And it was the first battle between Muslims and the pagans of Mecca in which this person was captured and he was killed because when they were in Mecca, this person used to mock Muhammad. At that time, Muhammad had no power, so he could not do anything about him. So he was talking all about tolerance and kindness. But the moment he gained power, and the moment he could capture this person, he killed that person, got him killed. Uqba bin Abu Mayyut was captured in the Battle of Badr. This was the first, again, first battle between the pagans and the Muslims. And he was killed instead of being ransomed because he threw dead animal entrails on Muhammad and wrapped his garment around Muhammad's neck while he was praying again in Mecca. So when they were in, because the pagans were not very happy with what Muhammad was doing. So, and they were torturing Muhammad and his followers in many ways. At that time, they were not in a position to retaliate. But later on, when Muhammad and Muslims became uh, stronger, they retaliated in a very, very cruel way. So there, these are just three, four examples that I have given. There are many such examples. And these examples show that Muhammad was not tolerant when it came to his own beliefs, when, his, when it came to his own body, his mind, and his teachings. These, these, are, the, uh, uh, these, these are the verses by uh, Asma bin Timarwan. Actually, the thing is that uh, in an average Muslim family, it is not possible not to get affected by the indoctrination that starts with chanting azan in the right ear of the newly born. This indoctrination is a never-ending process. The lullaby by the mothers is usually Allahu, which means God is great. When a child starts crawling and falls down, the words that automatically come out of everyone's mouths are Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And on any achievement, big or small, a child is greeted by the words, Allahu Akbar, God is great. There are many uh, such indoctrination. And uh, my parents, my society also tried to etch those indoctrination on my mind. Some of them are <clears throat> Jews and pigs are the filthiest creatures on earth. Jews and Christians could never be the friends of Muslims. Muhammad is the last prophet of Allah, and he is the blessing for all the universes, not just the universe, all the universes. The whole world was created for Muhammad. He was the only perfect human being and must be dearer to us than anyone or anything. Hellfire would never touch a person 
who loved him more than himself, his children, and his parents. So now you can see the kind of indoctrination that is etched on the minds of the Muslims. These, this is the, one of the poems by Abu Afaq, and he was killed for these verses. With this background in mind, the indoctrinated Muslims can get furious over anything which can slightly be linked with blasphemy of Muhammad or anyone they believe to be his near and dear one. So you cannot blaspheme his companions. You cannot blaspheme his family. By the way, I, I'm also, uh, my family, I am also a direct descendant of Muhammad. So my family is considered, in a way, it is considered superior to the other Muslims. Because I am born in a family which is directly linked with Muhammad. The data provided by National Commission for Justice and Peace shows a total of 633 Muslims, 494 Ahmadis, 187 Christians and 21 Hindus have been accused under various clauses of the blasphemy law since 1987. Now, Ahmadis, Ahmadis used to be a sect of, a mi minority sect of uh, is Muslims, of Islam. But later on, they were declared non-Muslims because of their certain beliefs which go against the mainstream Islam. So now, Ahmadis are considered uh, non-Muslims. And in Pakistan, they are considered the filthiest people. So you can go to a plaza, you can go to a shop, you can go somewhere, and you can find uh, very clearly written there that Qadianis are not allowed to come inside. Ahmadis are not, Qadianis and Ahmadis are the same things, that Qadianis or Ahmadis are not allowed to come inside the shop. The law is mostly used to settle personal scores. Therefore, not only minorities, but also the Muslims have been affected by this law. People tend to take law in their own hands and sometimes the accused is killed by the charged mob. Some major incidents are Tahir Iqbal, he was a Christian and he was basically, he was a Muslim. He converted to Christianity and he was accused of abusing Muhammad and he, he also gave tuition to uh, a few students. So, and um, he was also accused of imparting anti-Islamic education to children. He was arrested, he was denied bail, and he died in jail after allegedly being poisoned. Niamat Ahmar, he was 43, he was a Christian teacher in Faisalabad. Niamat's colleagues were not happy with his success with the children. So they convinced a student, who, his name was Farooq Ahmad, that Niamat had committed blasphemy. Ahmad believed that Niamat had uttered insults against the Prophet, and he stabbed him to death. The boy, the Muslim boy, he stabbed him to death. That Muslim boy was jailed for 14 years. Generally, it doesn't happen that a person who is killed on the charges of blasphemy is uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his killer. Uh, normally doesn't get any uh, sentence. But uh, in this case, the boy got 14 years imprisonment. Hafiz Farooq Sajjad, now he was a Muslim. And he was a Hafiz of Quran. A Hafiz of Quran means a person who has uh, um, learned Quran, Quran by heart. So he was a Hafiz, he was a Muslim. He was stoned to death after a Quran is in his house caught fire. The local mosque announced that a Christian had burned the Quran and a mob gathered outside Sajad's house. Sajad was beaten by the mob, after which the police came and took him into custody. However, the mob reached the police station and pelted Sajad with stones, eventually setting him on fire. The police had fled for safety by this time. Police left him and they themselves fled from the scene. And the charged mob, uh, in the end, uh, uh, burnt Sajjad. 
In July of 1995, Catherine Shaheen, a teacher in Lahore, was denied her salary as she was accused of blasphemy. Although she was not formally charged, Shaheen has been in hiding since then. Samuel Messi, a Christian, was arrested for allegedly defiling a mosque by spitting on its wall. Now that's his offense. While in police custody, Masi contracted tuberculosis and was sent to a local hospital, Gulab Devi Chest Hospital, for treatment. He was killed by a police officer who was one of the guards escorting him. He used a hammer to kill him in the presence of other officers and claimed that it was his duty as a Muslim to kill Masi. Now, these are famous, very famous Gojra rites. There were three Christians. Gojra is a, a place near Rawalpindi. It's near the capital of uh, Pakistan, Islamabad. It was reported that there were three Christians who had desecrated papers which had Quranic verses. On these reports, 40 houses and a church were set ablaze. Eight people were burnt alive who were in those buildings. And including women and children. Then the Joseph Colony incident in Lahore. Now Lahore is a very big city. It is the capital of Punjab. It's a very big and historic city. In Lahore, several thousand people attacked the Joseph Colony, which is a Christian neighborhood of about 200 homes, after a report that a Christian sanitation worker had blasphemed Muhammad. About 178 houses, 18 shops, and two churches were tossed by the angry mob. No one got hurt or killed in the incident, as the people had already fled their houses on the apprehension of attack. Had they been there, I mean, 178 houses, 18 shops, and these are some of the scenes. I try to take out very benign pictures. Now, this Junaid Hafiz case is very interesting. Junaid Hafiz is a Muslim. He was a poet and a Fulbright scholar. He was teaching English literature at a university in Multan. He was a liberal and he was liked by many of his students and was envied by the uh, fellow faculty members. He was accused of posting blasphemous material on Facebook. For a long time, he could not find a lawyer. Finally, Rashid Rahman from Human Rights Commission of Pakistan took his case. He was threatened, the lawyer was threatened to leave Hafiz's case, but he did not give in. Soon he was killed for representing Junaid Hafiz. This is the boy, Junaid Hafiz. And this is Rashid Rahman, who was killed when he was <coughs> going to the court. Now, uh, for people like us in Pakistan, it is not possible for us to post anything on Facebook under our own name. So what generally we do is that we make fake accounts and only then we can post anything on Facebook. I know even while doing so, it's not safe. But still, there are people who are trying, and there are people who are trying to make a difference and to bring some sanity in Pakistan, although they are very few in numbers. But, but Junaid Hafiz, was, uh, he was writing with his own name. And now, this is also another very, very, uh, uh, it's a, it's a case which, which, which is very hard for any one of us to forget. Shama, a woman, she was 24 and was accused of burning and desecrating the pages of Quran. She was illiterate and had no idea what she burnt. She and her husband worked at a brick kiln. 
as bonded laborers. Now, Pakistani law doesn't allow any uh, kind of slavery, but this is a common practice there. On apprehensions of attack, Shama and her husband Shahzad wanted to flee, but the kiln owner did not let them till they paid their debt. The mob attacked them, beating them with sticks and clubs, and then dragging them on road full of stones. Their clothes tore and bones crushed. The highly charged crowd did not leave them there. They were still breathing when the mob tossed them and threw them in the burning furnace of the brick kiln where they worked. Shama was pregnant at the time of the incident. These are the burnt bones which were later on recovered. That's Shama and Shahzad, her husband. When they were burnt. And then there was another uh, case which, uh, which again cannot be forgotten. Shabazz Bhatti was a Christian. He was a federal cabinet minister for minorities' affairs. He was an outspoken critic of the blasphemy laws in Pakistan. He was killed in the capital city when he was going to, uh, when he was on his way to work. And this, in this case, the governor of the uh, biggest province of Pakistan was killed. Now, Asya Bibi is the first Christian woman who was arrested and sentenced to death by hanging on the charge of blasphemy. Asya was accused of committing blasphemy after an argument at the farm where she worked. Asya is still in jail. Christians in Pakistan are considered lowly and generally get jobs as janitors. They are considered unclean and are not allowed to use the utensils that Muslims use. Asya was working on a farm where she drank water in a mug that was used by the Muslims. She was confronted by the other villagers. In a heated argument, she said, I believe in my religion and in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the sins of mankind. What did your Prophet Muhammad ever do to save mankind? Now, these words were considered blasphemous. And these words were used against her. In her words, after she was sentenced to death, I cried alone, putting my head in my hands. I can no longer bear the sight of people full of hatred, applauding the killing of a poor farm worker. I no longer see them, but I still hear them, the crowd who gave the judge a standing ovation, saying, kill her, kill her, Allahu Akbar. The courthouse is invaded by a euphoric horde who break down the doors, chanting, vengeance for the Holy Prophet. Allah is great. I was then thrown like an old rubbish sack into the van. I had lost all humanity in their eyes. This is Asya Bibi. She's still in jail. It did not end here. A month later, Salman Tasir, who was the governor of Punjab, stated that Shama Bibi would most likely be pardoned by the president if the high court did not suspend the sentence. But Lahore High Court issued a stay order against potential presidential pardon, which remains in, in force till date. In January 2013, 11, Salman Tasir was killed by his own guard, Mumtaz Qadri, for defending Asya Bibi. His ex, his, the Salman Tasir's actions were considered blasphemous by the hardliners in Pakistan because it was also considered blasphemy that he was taking side of Asya Bibi. Mumtaz Qadri, his assassin, was given special protocol by many law enforcing personnel and also by the lawyers. He was given death sentence and was executed on February 29th this year. This execution is considered a major step in the turn a blind eye policy of the executive and judiciary of Pakistan. This is Salman Tasir with Asya Bibi because this person was trying to help out this woman.
and then he was killed by this person who is hugged by a lawyer and this lawyer later on became a judge of the Islamabad High Court. This picture went viral. Umtaz Qadri was kissed by Shaukat Siddiqui, a lawyer of Rawalpindi who was later on appointed as judge of the Islamabad High Court. He heard the appeal of Umtaz Qadri, upheld his death sentence, but very cunningly pronounced that the murder committed by him was not an act of terrorism. This could have paved way for Qadri to get away with the murder as a murder which is not an act of terrorism is compoundable. He could go scot-free after paying blood money to the family of the deceased. However, the Supreme Court of Pakistan changed his ruling and put the case back under Anti-Terrorism Act. This is Mumtaz Qadri. You can see this garland around his neck. This is the time when he was brought for his trial in the Islamabad courts. He was given a hero's welcome by the lawyers, by the police officials, by the civilians, by everyone. And then Mumtaz Qadri was executed on February 29, 2016. He had a hero's funeral. Look at the people who have gathered for his funeral. In Pakistan, blasphemy laws are not, are not just on the pages of Pakistan Penal Code. They run in the blood of the Muslims living in a highly indoctrinated society. People think that killing a blasphemer will get them to par paradise. In case of mob attack, the law enforcing agencies usually turn a blind eye. The cases prepared by the police are weak, with no solid evidence against anyone, and therefore the attackers go scot-free. Under these circumstances, the execution of Mumtaz Qadri came as a welcome step, but is not enough as there are thousands of people who are willing to kill to safeguard the honor of their prophet. And we feel that these steps need to be taken in order to bring some sanity in Pakistan regarding these laws. First of all, blasphemy laws need to be abolished. When the human rights workers say that these laws need to be abolished, the counterclaim is that if these laws are abolished, people will take law in their own hands. But as we can see, that people have already, at many occasions, they have taken law in their own hands. So with or without these laws, that's what is happening. The government of Pakistan should take immediate steps to change the syllabus of educational institutions, making it humanistic and secular, so that all the indoctrination is wiped away from the syllabus. The Friday sermons, uh, the Muslims have a tradition, they have a Friday prayer noon, at noon time. And uh, this Friday sermon is of uh, very, it's, it's a very important thing in uh, the prayers. The Friday sermons should be controlled and strictly monitored. Any cleric giving a sermon based on intolerance or spreading hatred should be dismissed from his position and dealt with under the law. The syllabus of religious madrasas there are schools which are totally dedicated to uh, religious education. This, this, their syllabus should be re reviewed and updated, bringing it at par with the mainstream schools. The funds received by the madrasas should be strictly monitored and regularly audited. The media should make a code of conduct wherein hate speeches and religious intolerance should be discouraged. Now, any questions? Did you say at the beginning that the blasphemy laws were brought by the British? Yes. I don't understand that. Yeah. Why? India was a multi uh, subcontinent when the undivided India. It was a multicultural cultural and multi ethnic society. It had many religions, it had many sects. But interestingly, 
you will find hardly hardly any uh, uh, incident which can be linked to blasphemy till the time general ziaul haq came and when he came in 1977 the cases just started pouring in uh the two um sections of the law you showed were those added by uh by the general or were they in, in the original british there were some uh, uh sections which were originally in the pakistan penal code that was made by the british but there there were uh, later on there were inclusions made in that okay. which which made it more lethal okay. because later on md's were also declared non muslims and there were certain sections which are uh, exclusively about md's sure. let me see if i understand were the are the laws such that in pakistan because i've heard it i mean I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about how in Pakistan officially the stance of the government is that nobody can be executed for being an apostate but yes. the unofficial I mean basically they kind of turn a blind eye yeah. to the person that walks away and it's it's like uh today when I was coming here I was talking to my husband that uh I see that uh uh there is a group that holds uh, group meetings uh about atheism and uh, free thinking and all and they also put a board outside that we are th- free thinkers and agnostics and atheists and uh, uh, we are holding a meet up of atheists and agnostics you cannot imagine doing this in pakistan because you see anything which is it means that if i leave my religion it means that i have committed a major sin that i have rebelled against god that i have rebelled against my prophet and therefore i am liable to be killed and muhammad himself killed many got many people killed or when they became apostates so following the tradition of muhammad because it means that you have displeased muhammad and displeasing him means that you have done something so wrong that you have to re- repay your sins uh, by your blood i heard it like him to a 50 south when you went into a community and then the sheriff was a member of the clan and there was like well the clan committed an atrocity and we need to get the sheriff to investigate and there was like yeah uh, yes see yes you know um it's all about a highly indoctrinated mind it's all about uh and about defiling of quran till a few years back uh, it was uh, it was a routine thing that uh, people used to collect all the torn pages of quran and they used to burn them or throw them in the in water but now somehow this burning of quran any even a small page which has some quranic verses if you burn them people will burn you and this is this comes from a religion of peace this comes from the teachings of a person who is considered a blessing for the universes al alamin alam is just one universe alamin it's it's a it's a, it's an arabic word alamin means all the universes which are trillions and i don't know how many Did the majority of pakistanis feel feel that like that's the right thing to do to punish people for bias for me actually um, yes actually um generally people 
do not like any person who uh, defiles or disrespects the the prophet but uh, and most of the people will not uh, stand up and kill you but there are people a minority who can just who are going by their work and uh, they'll get impressed by a friday sermon of a mullah and they'll get up and they'll kill you so it's a, it's a it's a highly unpredictable thing you cannot even like a person sitting next to me might some day get up and kill me because you never know what's going on it it's it's he's highly indoctrinated you do you you have no idea what goes on in his what is going on in his mind and uh, so a very normal person may get up and kill you uh during uh, uh, the british period there was uh, there's a very famous case of uh, ghazi alamdin now this alamdin was a was a normal boy average muslim boy and there was a hindu uh, publisher he published a book about muhammad very interestingly the book which is not very big it's a small book except for the covers the front cover and the back cover and the name of the book the rest everything in the book was taken out from the hadith hadith is the sayings and actions of the holy prophet so he compiled uh, the hadith of muhammad in that book and just gave it a na- the name rangila rasul now rangila rasul means um, roughly that uh, a lustful prophet prophet a prophet who has lust for women so it was uh, muslims protested against that although there was nothing in the book which he wrote himself all the material was taken out from the books of the muslims only the front cover and the back cover was and the name was given by him so uh in one sermon uh, this qazi alamdin was sitting somewhere in, in some mosque and he heard a sermon that this man blasphemed the holy prophet and uh qazi alamdin got up he got a knife and went and killed that publisher that publisher was was a hindu and it was the british period uh muhammad ali jinnah defended the founder of pakistan at that time pakistan was not made he uh, came as a defense lawyer but he lost the case and ghazi alamdin was later on hanged it's interesting because i mean i know that the british have their I mean, the, the 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 royalty and british are the defenders of the church of england so there's that kind of that there's not a real clear separation of church and state so it sort of seems like maybe they left some of that in uh, Pakistan and India both actually uh, let me uh, i mean although we were once we were slaves we were ruled by british but to be honest all the laws which are good which are practical all the laws in pakistan are given by the british our railway system is given by the british our uh, 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 telegraph system our uh, uh, communication system everything was given by the british not only that british also uh, um, they uh, took steps to uh, to popularize uh, urdu urdu is the local language of pakistan at that time it was the, it was considered to be the language of the muslims 
and the, it was interestingly it was the british who made the uh, who made congress the muslims and the hindus of uh, uh, united india did not have a political party they did not know how to get their rights it was all given to them by the british and very interestingly there's another law which i uh, i would like to tell you a muslim woman uh cannot get divorce on many counts like if a woman uh, if if my husband goes somewhere and i cannot find him he might be living or he might be dead or anything even then a muslim woman had to uh wait for him for 99 years to get to get a legal separation so they reduced the period to 7 years so there are many they have given a lot of things to the to india and pakistan and we should be thankful to them for that curiosity the separation of church and state doesn't sound like it's, there's much of that at all but is it official or is it it is official Pakistan the name of Pakistan is the Islamic Republic of Pakistan now there is another thing uh there uh, if you know that uh, in Bangladesh uh, some bloggers were killed uh, because of their uh, liberal views or atheistic views after that a few days back i was uh, reading in a newspaper that bangladesh is thinking to uh, uh to um, uh, uh, to get to um, uh, abolish uh, islam as their of, of official religion you know it's it's interesting because bangladesh or i understand the global warming could be a huge population of people fleeing and india has literally put up a fence along Bangladesh border because they don't want to come in. That could be a total mess coming and it's the population of Bangladesh is huge yeah. from what I understand. Yeah. This is going to be a huge refuge and the entire of the country of Bangladesh the highest points are like 13 feet above sea level or something. Yeah. It's like yeah. this is going to be a night a, a, a nightmare as far as the number of people fleeing back right of bangladesh where they going to go and uh, one more thing that not all pakistanis are uh, are uh, i mean all pakistanis are indoctrinated but not all will get up and kill you uh, and uh, you might have uh, uh, seen uh, one of our girls getting oscar a second time her name is sharmin ubach in chennai she got an ask oscar first on uh, uh, the acid burning cases uh, she uh, made a documentary on acid burning uh, victims and uh, this time probably it's about the honor killing she made a documentary on that and she got an oscar and then we have our very beloved malala yusuf zai and uh, there are many women who are working uh, not only very hard but also uh, they are really really working for the for the for human rights for uh, the betterment of a society now you might have heard the name of asma jahangir she is a lawyer you might have heard the name of hena jilani she is she is her sister also a lawyer and then there are many sociologists also curious to pakistan has got the atomic bomb and they because they were they they got it because india had it and it was like we have to have it and, and they they brag that they're the yeah. owner of the islamic atomic bomb actually the islamic atomic bomb Uh, this word was this name was given to our bomb by none other than america uh and uh, yes 
actually uh, when in 70s india uh, had this atomic test then pakistan knew that we have to do something about it in order to have balance of power in the region and then without any provocation or anything india just out of nothing it uh, tested its nuclear device and uh, then if i don't know probably you people don't watch indian channels but we do uh, and uh, they were like uh, dancing and they were uh, challenging pakistan that now we'll wipe you from the uh, from this planet and we'll do this and we'll do that and uh, then so pakistan I belong to Kashmir. <laughs> I belong to the Pakistani side of Kashmir. It's a beautiful place. I have not seen any place here in America till now. Maybe later on I see something. But there is nothing as beautiful as Kashmir. Not that I have my uh, emotional attachment with the place, uh, but seeing is believing. It's very beautiful. Uh, you had some memories earlier of the people that have been killed, and, and since um, what's 1977, uh, how many people have been killed from blasphemy laws? Uh, no, I do not have the exact uh, number. Uh, it's it was there. Uh, yeah, was that just the ones that were like yeah. legally killed by them, or was that uh, no? No, the cases, those were the people against whom the cases were made. But there are, I've just quoted a few incidents right. because obviously there isn't much time. Yeah, I was, I was just kind of wondering, I guess, how many people have been killed. Like, the, this, there was a Muslim professor. He was the dean of Islamic, uh, he was uh, Islamic studies in Karachi University. Karachi again is the biggest city of Pakistan. He was killed on the charges of blasphemy. And you know what blasphemy did he do? Did he commit? He said that it's not important to do miswak. Miswak is a branch of a tree which is used for tooth cleaning, teeth cleaning. And uh, it was used by the prophet. That it's not important. Now, don't, don't get stuck in miswak and all. And it was believed that he committed blasphemy and he was killed. His name was Professor Shaquille Oj. So these were some major incidents that, but there are so many, so many that I can it's understandable why so many people are fleeing the whole area right now with it. Because if you can't trust your neighbor, then... Yeah. It sounds like these laws could, I mean, especially when it's even an innuendo or, or that, that can yeah. be, I mean, your neighbor looks the wrong way and it's like, and you don't like him, then you use him. Yeah. I, can, I can just, if I do not like a person, I, or I, if I have a property dispute with someone, what I need to do is go on the street and scream loudly that this person has committed blasphemy against the prophet. And there, no one will need to investigate it there will be no trial and that person will be like he'll be killed in no time do you know how much air fare to Kashmir is it really is beautiful <laughs> yes it is oh my gosh and uh, islamabad which is the capital city of pakistan is very beautiful it's very picturesque I was living in Islamabad. I lived there for almost 10 years because my job was there. And uh, I never took it for granted. I never took that beauty for granted. Would you go back and visit? I'll definitely go. That's my country. I love my country. <laughs> Although I cannot say many things there, but even then I love my country. <laughs> 
How long have you lived here? Uh, almost a year now. I got married here. <laughs> Thanks for <laughs> And I honestly, I feel very happy here because there are many things which I, I could never say, which I can say now. <laughs> because I'm in America. But even then, my friends tell me not to be very vocal about uh, certain things because the Muslims here are not less fanatic. You see what happened in Brussels today. Luma, how should the West approach the Islamic world? I really don't know how to speak to somebody who is uh, a strong believer of Islam. I don't even know how to speak to somebody who's a strong Christian, but how, what do you advise? What do you advise? Actually, what I see uh, being a Muslim, you cannot understand Islam till the time you have been a part of that cult, till the time you have been a part of that mafia. Uh, I see people here who are, uh, uh, who are trying to be politically correct. I see Europe trying to be politically correct. I would advise never trust a Muslim. I'm not saying that there are not good Muslims. They are not actually good Muslims. They are good people. Had they been Christians or Jews or atheists or whatever, they would have been good. So, yes, there are good people in the Muslim world also. But generally speaking, you cannot say they are unpredictable people. When I was uh, working in the bank uh, and I had a very high position, it was a government bank. And in government bank, we have certain facilities and certain perks. So I had my uh, personal assistant, who was a, a male personal assistant. He had this much of a beard. And an Islamic kind of beard, not the kind of beard that you have or you have. <laughs> and uh, he respected me a lot. Uh, he took my orders. He did what I told him to do. But I also knew that I do not have to say many things uh, loudly. And then there are certain traditions. We start our meetings with the recitation of Holy Quran. And uh, when this happens, a woman is supposed to, this is, this is my dupatta. I am wearing a Pakistani dress today. So I have to cover my head at least like this while reciting, while the recitation is going on. I never did that. And I knew that people did not like it. But since I was on a very high position, no one could point it out. But I knew that they were uncomfortable with this. And then everyone would go and uh, start praying in the office hours. I would never uh, get up from my seat. And I know that they, they talked about it, that Madam Huma never prays. But they could not say so in front of me. Thank you. I should be thankful to you for uh, being here and uh, for listening to all this. Uh, and I had a question about your, your education, because you're always here, about Muslim women not being able to get educated. Now, I know that historically that's not the truth, but no, in some not. situations it is the truth. Do you know? Yes, yes. There are all kinds of people uh, in the Muslim world. There are all kinds of people in Pakistan. 
our society has different sections, different segments. And there are many people who are living in the 14th century and there are many people who are living in the 21st century. Like I was, at that time I was unmarried when I moved to Islamabad and I lived on my own. In Pakistan, this is, this is kind of a taboo for a single woman to live on her own. She has to live with a male relative or at least uh, a motherly kind of relative, even if not with her mother with some aunt or someone. But I was living on my own. And I lived like that for almost 10 years. So, and my family is a, my family is, uh, uh, is a liberal family. We are all well-educated people. And uh, a sister of mine is an educationist. Another sister is running her own business. I was a lawyer. <laughs> and the same thing goes with our, uh, with my extended family. They are not very liberal. Uh, the girls wear hijab when they go out, but they are getting, they are all getting education. They are doctors, they are professors. Uh, and those who are just housewives are also uh, well educated. So people have started knowing the importance of uh, women education. But I'm not saying that everyone is getting good education. Well, that's true here too. <laughs> and sometimes I see that uh, Pakistani girls and even boys, they are very brilliant, but they do not get as much opportunity uh, as the students that I see get here. Do you see things getting better or worse in Pakistan today? Paradoxically, both. In terms of education, things are getting better. In terms of religious extremism, I see things deteriorating. It's kind of the same here too. No, I know when I was... Uh, I'm, I'm writing a book about my journey from Islam to atheism. And when I was writing about the chapter of indoctrination, I knew that what I'm writing is not just limited to Pakistan. It is not just limited to my life. It is not just limited to, to any Islamic country. It's a universal thing. This indoctrination is a universal thing. And thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to tell you about one side of Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has many positive sides also. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>